who is love and that you call us to love you, to love our neighbors, to love ourselves and to love one another. And we pray as we look at your word together this morning that your spirit, the spirit who pours your love into our hearts will uh, expand our hearts, open our minds that we might see you and love you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, if you look in your seat in front of you, you should see one of these. If you'd like to take it and have a little flick through, uh, it is our new Making Disciple Makers small group resource. As you can see on the front, it says, Questions to Aid Disciple Making Conversations. We're launching it today. We hope... We've worked on it for quite some time, and we hope it will be a really helpful resource for you, either as an individual, thinking about your own discipleship, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, For you, if you are mentoring somebody, so if you're a leader and you are uh, mentoring uh, another leader who you are investing in, or if you are a small group leader or a small group member, we're going to be using this tool, I hope, Uh, to grow as disciples together. So I hope it's going to be a real uh, help for you. And this series, All You Need Is Love, is based really around question uh, one. And uh, I'd love you to keep it open in front of you as I talk this morning. So here in this passage in Mark 12, keep that open as well, um, a scribe asks Jesus to sum up the law. In a nutshell, he says, if you were to boil the whole Torah down, the first five books of Moses, uh, what would you say it was? If um, your house was burning down and you had to grab one thing in that house, the most important thing to you, the, the thing that summed up your entire life, everything you thought, everything you had done, what would that one thing be? That is effectively what the scribe is asking Jesus. What really matters to you? What would you grab? And that wasn't an unusual question for a rabbi to be asked. Every rabbi had a view about that question. The Mishnah and the Talmud, they are a collection of sayings by the rabbis that really try and answer that question. So you get Rabbi Hillel, who uh, wrote 20 years before Jesus, so really pretty much a contemporary of Jesus. He said this what his answer was, what you would not want done to you, do not do to your neighbor. Kind of, kind of a negative. And he said, that is the entire Torah, the law. Everything else is interpretation. Uh, rabbi Akiba, famous rabbi in the second century, 135 AD, uh, said it was Leviticus 19 verse 8, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Third century rabbi said it was Proverbs 3 verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge God and he will make your paths straight. Rabbi Simle uh, in uh, AD uh, 260 said it was Habakkuk 2 verse 4. The righteous shall live by faith. So every rabbi had a view about the summary of the law. And Jesus also had a view. And his view is kind of two parts really. Firstly, he quotes the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. It was the prayer that every devout Jew prayed twice a day. They recited it morning and evening. It is, in effect, the Jewish equivalent of the Christian creed. Love the Lord your God. Oh, it's this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The Shema. But then he quotes Leviticus 19 verse 18, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then, of course, later on in John's gospel, he adds a third, a new commandment. John 13 verse 34, love one another. So what he's saying, if you want to sum up the whole of the law, everything God says about following him, he says, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself, and the new commandment, love one another. That is how Jesus defines discipleship. That's how he says, if you want to follow me, this is what you must do. It's not about learning more. 
It's not about study. It's not about right doctrine. All those things matter, but they serve a greater end. They are not ends in themselves. It's not about doing more. It's not about changing the world. It's not about um, serving the poor. Those things matter. They're good things to do. They change our hearts, but they're not ends in themselves. They serve a greater end. The greater end is loving more. Jesus is saying following him is not about learning more. It's not about doing more. It's about loving more. Loving God, loving your neighbor, loving yourself, and loving one another. And that's the inspiration for making disciple makers. That's the inspiration for question one. What is God saying to you about loving God, loving your neighbor, loving yourself, loving one another? And we've got a little Bible study um, addition to this that will take you through a series of studies that allows you to explore in your small group a little bit more deeply what God is saying about these things. But then you've got to ask the question, well, what does that look like in practice? And that's where we've got to question two. What are you doing about it? And then we look at, well, some of those things that perhaps get in the way of us loving God, loving our neighbor, loving ourselves, loving one another. Why aren't we doing it? We explore that. Well, we look at how we are doing. What's getting in the way? Are you tired? Have you stopped praying or reading your Bible? Perhaps something's gone wrong. And we need to look at the way sin is at work, hardening our hearts, stopping us from loving more. And so we've got a little way in which we can explain, uh, explore that together. And then finally, how is God going to help us love more? What is God doing as he saves us and changes and transforms our lives? So that, our prayer for this really is that it helps you love more. Love God, love neighbor, love yourself easily forgotten, and love one another. So use it yourself. Use it in your one-to-ones with the people you're discipling. Use it in your small group. We're using it in the staff team. Uh, We're using it with connect group leaders. So we hope it can become our vocabulary, if you like, that can help us understand what it is we're doing as we're growing more and more into God. And today, we're looking at the first of those four loves. We're looking at loving God. And quite simply, we're going to look at two things. Why should we love God? And how should we love God? And we're going to focus really on those first two questions in the booklet. So why should we love God? Essentially, for who he is and for what he has done. And I want you to hold in your mind four things about who God is and what he's done that I hope will inspire your love for him, your worship, your praise, your life. Four G's. The first G, God is great. I don't know if you've ever thought about how great God is. God is immense and infinite. Think about the speed of light for a moment. It is 186,000 miles a second. Light circles the earth in one second. It gets to the moon in two seconds. It takes 4.3 years to get to the nearest star. Think about how far away that is. It takes 100,000 years for that light to get to the edge of our galaxy. The next galaxy is 2 million light years away. My imagination is beginning to crumble at this point. The universe has 100 billion galaxies in it. And the Bible says God holds it in the palm of his hand. God spoke it into being. God is outside and beyond the universe. He is immense and infinite. There is no end to our God. He goes on and on and on. But God is eternal too. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. Multicellular life appeared only one billion years ago. Plants and insects and reptiles and mammals appeared about 400 million years ago. Humans, 200,000 years ago. Pretty new, really. And God has seen it 
all. He was there through it all. And more than that, God sustains and governs all of that history. He is sovereign over history. He orders and determines everything that happens. He enables and maintains even our freedom. Try getting your head around that if you can. God is not only outside and beyond the universe, he is outside and beyond time itself. God is great. God is glorious too. God is beautiful. In fact, he's, he's beauty itself. When we describe the glory of something, we are talking about something kind of flourishing, fully alive, aren't we? We talk about a, a, a glorious flower in full bloom. It's fully alive. It's at the pinnacle of its existence. There is an intensity of being about something in its glory. Maybe that's the heat of the sun in its splendor and its majesty. The Bible talks about God's brilliance, his brightness. It says God thrills our souls and fills us with wonder and delight. It's one of the things that uh, my uh, little girl, Amelia, who's, as most of you know, is just three, uh, to see her wonder and delight in life is amazing. She can sit down and play with her toys and get lost in her imagination and talk between the two of them, or three of them, or however many they are, and she's created this world, and she is happy, full of awe and wonder, it's an amazing thing to behold. The, uh, yesterday, uh, I was doing, I, we were just, I was just being a monster, and chasing her around the room with her friend, also called Amelia. And she just kept saying, more daddy, more daddy, until I was exhausted. More daddy, more daddy. She loved every minute of it. It's just absolute wonder for her. It thrills her soul to have her daddy playing with her. It is as simple for her as that. And God thrills us, thrills our souls. But more than that, more than wonder, there is, there is a little bit of fear and threat in there too, isn't there? Just thrown into the mix. We have a, one of our favorite holidays was uh, in, um, in Switzerland, in the valley of the, uh, of the waterfalls. I think there are 52 waterfalls in the Lautenbrunnen Valley. Uh, the first one, as you come around the corner, is the, the Staubach Falls. And I remember we had had an incredibly stressful journey. And, um, uh, and uh, I was really quite grumpy and a bit cross, as often I am when traveling. And uh, we came around the corner, and there, coming down hundreds of feet, was this waterfall. And I just got quite emotional, because it was beautiful. It was It was wonderful delighted my soul. I thought, I'm on holiday. Praise the Lord. It was amazing. And then we drove in and we parked the car and we walked to another waterfall. So we weren't planning on doing it. We just wanted to explore the valley. But we came across the Trommelback Falls. Anybody been to the Trommelback Falls? There's a few people there. Um, they are uh, an incredible waterfall that is inside the mountain. So it's gouged out the rock. And they've managed to put a walkway around the waterfall. And you can get so close to it. It's like here. And it's, it's not a little waterfall. It is an absolutely gigantic, powerful, awe-inspiring waterfall. And when you get close to the edge and you hold onto the rail, you grip the rail. That's fair, isn't it? And you think... If I move, I could die. This is a glorious thing. It is beautiful. It is overwhelming. It is frightening in its power. You can feel your heart kind of pounding and pulsating with you. It races in the face of its beauty and its terrifying awe. God is glorious. Thirdly, God is good. Do you know God satisfies your soul? Like nothing else, he offers you and me lasting fulfillment, complete delight, unbridled joy. The Christian life isn't dreary abstinence. We have found treasure. So often we forget that. Jonathan Edwards, the great uh, revivalist from the 18th century, a contemporary of John Wesley, an American, probably their greatest theologian too, so a man of incredible intellect, but he understood how good God was, and he said, God is like honey. 
Somebody can say to you, honey, is sweet, uh, it's good for you, uh, it's a beautiful color, it's lovely to look at, it's really nice to taste too, but you don't experience that until you taste the honey. And God is the same. We've got to taste God and see, says the Bible, that the Lord is good. Because all of us want satisfaction in our lives, don't we? We all are aware of that profound sense of lack, that something is missing. It's what we talk about on Alpha. Surely there is more to life than this. If you're asking that question, speak to Darren about Alpha. Come on, come and join the course. And so often we try and appease that sense of lack with other things, created things that we hope will provide us with satisfaction. And the Bible calls that idolatry. And it says it will never work. It will, they will always let us down. These things that we look to satisfy our lives will always fail us in the end because it is only God who is not just good, he is goodness itself. So he is better than everything else. He's more fulfilling, more delightful, more enjoyable. Every longing you have, every sense of lack in your soul is ultimately a longing for God that only God himself can fulfill. C.S. Lewis wrote this once when he was thinking about his own sense of, of lack. He said, there have been times when I think I do not desire heaven. But more often... I find myself wondering whether in our heart of hearts we have ever desired anything else. It is the secret signature of each soul, the incommunicable and unappeasable want. If you want something desperately, ultimately, it's God you really want because God is good. So when we look to God for satisfaction rather than the things he has created, that's the opposite of idolatry, that's worship. That's loving God. So God is good. Fourth G, what have we got so far? First G was? God is great. Second G, God is? Third G, God is? Fourth G, God is gracious. God is merciful. He is the one that makes us right with him. We could never do that ourselves. He is the one who forgives us. He is the one who justifies us, makes things right between us and him. He is the one who is gentle and kind to the children that he loves. It means you and I, we don't have to perform when we come before him. We don't have a duty. There is no room for guilt in the Christian life. There is no room for fear or anxiety. This radical sense of insecurity that the religious have, that really they're not acceptable to God. We don't have that because there is no need for us to prove ourselves because God is gracious. That is good news, isn't it? Isn't it? I thought it was. So why should we worship God? Because he is great, he is glorious, he is good, and he is gracious. That is what God says when he says, we need to love God. That's why. But how should we do it? How should we love God? Our culture, doesn't it, tells us that love is kind of uncontrollable. There's nothing we can do about it. We fall in and fall out of love. Love is a feeling. It's an emotion. It happens. And that's the way it is. But the Bible paints a more complex picture than that. It talks about we are to love with our whole selves, all of our personalities, not just our emotions. It talks about the heart, which is talking about our emotions and our feelings. But it also talks about our souls. The word there in Greek is, is psyche. It talks about our minds, our bodies. And within that biblical picture, there's great overlap between all those things. So the heart has thoughts. The mind can be the center of our personality. 